I think you've made your point, Goldfinger. Thank you for the demonstration. Choose your next witticism carefully, Mr. Bond. It may be your last. Do you expect me to talk? No, go, Mr. Bond. I expect you to die. Welcome to the Tailoring Talk Show with me, your host, Roberto Rivilla. I'm a bespoke tailor, menswear designer, and owner of Roberto Rivilla London Suit and Shirt Makers. This is the podcast where you drop in for the threads, but often leave with something quite unexpected. If you haven't already, please support the show by subscribing. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please help me out by leaving a rating and a review. It's time for part three of the Tailoring Talk James Bondathon, where we follow the James Bond series in order, ticking off each movie as each month goes by. My guests and I will be deep diving into each film, covering everything from our overall review, and then digging into the clothes, the gadgets, the cast, our favourite moments from each instalment, and much, much more. You've probably already guessed that number three means we go back in time to 1964. Yes, it is Goldfinger. And I'm joined in the Tailoring Talk Madhouse once again by our very own odd job, Mr. Philip Rahman. How are you, sir? Bobby, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. You're missing your bowler hat, Phil. I'm a bit disappointed. <laughs> I tried to add a little bit of character tonight, you know, so uh, I've got some... Uh... A little bit of memorabilia, um, which is uh, which is in the background, and uh, you know, I thought I'd dress up a little bit for this evening as well. Yeah, we've got a white shirt. I I might put a tux on for one of these actually. Um, yeah, what? Well, yeah, well now I'm back at work. I'm back in the office. I'm just uh, I'm dressing up when everyone else is still in dress down. I'm actually pulling on the uh, suits. It just makes me feel so good, actually. So yeah. Yeah, good for you. That's what we like to hear. We're also joined by a dear friend and colleague of mine from the Play Paul's Turn podcast. Yes, it is the voice of reason, the kindest voice in podcasting. If we were the Ghostbusters, he would be our very own Ray Stance. It's Alex Hansford. Alex, how are you? Oh, shucks. Thanks. Thanks, Bobby. I like that. <laughs> I'm good, thanks. You I'm are good. You are the voice of reason. Do you know when I, I listen back to... Um, so when I edited f- from Russia With Love and... The No Time to Die massive spoiler review that we did before Christmas. And uh, I listened back to some of our more lively Play Pools Turn episodes. Mm. And you definitely are the voice of reason, Alex, <laughs> I have to say. When I, everybody I else so. is losing control, yeah. everybody needs a bit of Alex Hansford. You're, you're like, a, you're like a, a, a safety harness. Yes, that's right. I'm your safety dancer. But, but, yeah. but not the sexy voice. <laughs> no. No, sexy voice isn't here. Unfortunately, John John couldn't be with us uh, today. You know, as a as a teacher and a very busy one at that. Unfortunately, he uh, had some things come up. So, but he will he will return. So we're gonna kick things off. Well, actually, firstly, I want to just uh, say to our audience and our listeners, warning, spoiler alert. We are going to be spoiling Goldfinger. So if you have not seen it. And it has been out for 60... 57 years. 57 odd years. <laughs> uh, then what have you been doing? I actually only saw it for the first time yesterday, to be fair. Alex, had you seen Goldfinger before? Oh, yesterday? oh yeah, I'd seen it before, for sure. Oh, yeah, okay. I've got the Blu-ray set. Um, and it obviously, if you're going to start the Blu-ray set, you start it at the, at, the, at the start and work your way through. So, yeah, I've seen it before and it's it is a bit of a classic. But uh, but I needed to refresh my memory. There is a yeah. lot of Bond girls, and uh, yeah, there are a lot of Bond. They just <laughs> amp everything up for this one, don't they? Yeah. Phil, um, 
Now, how far along? Because you're slightly ahead in in the sort of Bond rewatch. Where are you now? Because last time we spoke, you'd missed out. I think you'd missed, I've out, missed out Thunderball. A chunk, yeah, yeah, you'd missed out a couple. To be fair, Goldfinger actually wasn't meant to be the next film in the series. It, it was actually going to be on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Um, but I don't know what the reason was. I can't remember. Alex will probably look it up on IMDb now. But um, but uh, they they basically switched and a, a script treatment for Goldfinger was submitted while they were still filming from Russia with Love and, and that became the third film. Um, but how far in are you now? Well, I went to Goldfinger and then I went straight to Diamonds Are Forever. I think, guess I was just following the Shirley Bassey soundtrack essentially and that's probably how it ended up going to that one um but i've missed out a a chunk of films in between so i'm gonna have to catch up before uh, next month i guess yeah yeah so now you'll be able to actually follow them in order um so yeah so anyway that was our spoiler warning um so we're going to start with an icebreaker question which i've borrowed from play paul's turn um i'm sure john won't mind hopefully he'll actually be rather proud um so here it is if you were a bond girl what would your Bond girl name be? And we'll start in alphabetical order. We'll go with Alex first. So if I was a Bond girl, this is an obscure uh, request. I would be Miss Knightley uh, and I it would be first name Ivana. So Ivana Knightley. Ivana Knightley. Ivana yeah. Knightley. I, don't, I can't make anything dirty out of that. Oh no! Um, you could you could do. I mean, my middle name middle name could be twice. Well, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Brilliant, <laughs> Philip. Well, if I'm following the format that you gave me, now that, that was actually the, the thing... Graham that was the Graham Norton formula. Okay. Well, the format if you gave based on the format you gave me, my um, Bond girl name would be Ghoulies Dyer. Right, <laughs> but if I was going to choose it completely myself, I think I'd have to go for Miss Decor Radio. Nice. Again, I don't know if it's if it's just okay. that it's Monday if, evening, but I'm not getting anything from that. Well, oh, well, I think Alex has picked it up. If you look on uh, the what is it the um. The uh, dictionary, well, the Urban Dictionary. If you look mm-hmm. up "decorator radio," oh, uh, okay. you will you will figure it out. I'll look that up. Uh, you don't, so you again, don't know I... what the decorator's radio is? No, I have no idea. <laughs> um, so, and considering okay. I'm building a house at the moment, maybe I should. So I will go and look that up, <laughs> and I will get my decorator's radio. Alex is looking um, it up now. He's going to tell you. All right. Well, I don't we're... really want to talk about it. It's a bit rude. <laughs> we're trying not to get an explicit rating on this episode, so uh, it's just you know we've still got a long we've got what, a long what, way to go. What color is paint normally? White. Okay. And hey, that girl is beautiful. I'd love to turn her face into a decorator's radio. I would love. Oh, well, that's just... really dis- yeah. that's disgusting. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Any ladies listening, I'm so sorry. Um, okay, moving on swiftly. Blush. Moving on swiftly. So I'm I'm using the Graham Norton um, formula because I couldn't really think of anything. And so using the Graham Norton formula, my uh, Bond girl name would be Little Bobby No Idea. Because Little Bobby Little is what Bobby. I used to call it. And... <laughs> No idea, because I have no idea what my grandmother's maiden name is. So there we go. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure after that example, I don't need to explain what the uh, Graham Norton formula is. So um, as I mentioned before, I saw Goldfinger for the first time yesterday um, and thoroughly enjoyed it. It was, uh, it was a lovely two-hour romp. Um so these these films were, I mean, they were filmed pretty much back to back because we had Doctor No 1962, From Russia with Love 63, 64 Goldfinger. Then they start filming almost immediately after this one, 65 Thunderball. Uh, but yeah, released in 1964, starring Sean Connery as James Bond. 
Honor Blackman as Pussy Galore and the inspiration for our rice breaker question today because I just could not get over that name <laughs> and how they got away with it as well. Gert Frobe as Auric Goldfinger, uh, Jill Masterson as Shirley Eaton. Uh, sorry, no, Shirley Eaton as Jill Masterson. <laughs> Uh, Tanya Mallet as Tinny Masterson, Harold Sakata as Oddjob, Bernard Lee as M, um, and I think it's pronounced Sec Linda as Felix Leiter, um, replacing Jack Lord, who was Felix in Doctor No. Bless you, Alex. Um, that was a really silent sneeze as well. It's very professional. Lois Maxwell as Miss Moneypenny, and the lovely Desmond Llewellyn as Q. Starting off, we get the full sort of adventure within an adventure opening sequence with a pigeon or a duck or something sort of making its way across the water. Uh, and then we see that it's actually attached to Bond's toupee, I mean his head. And then Bond gets out of the water and goes and blows something up. What did we think of this opening compared to From Russia With Love? Because From Russia With Love was full of intrigue and it was really exciting. This one kind of seems like it was more the sort of traditional Bond formula that we know and love. I mean, for me, what I really liked about it when I first saw it was it was you got the sense of where sort of true lies got their inspiration from at the very beginning. And uh, and that's the, the sort of the, the thing that left me as soon as he sort of gets out of his, um, you know, his, his uh, diving suit. He's got a perfectly pressed white tux and uh, ready to kind of like meet up with uh, his uh, whoever he's meeting up with and uh, you know and he just looks the, he just looks the absolute business so it's just um that's I read that was what sort of uh, why I was what I took from it but I think with true lies they took it to a completely different level um and it was there's so much more action but there's only so much they could do I guess back in 64 yeah they, we also had the, the grappling hook as well, which, I mean, that actually brought back memories of uh, Enter the Dragon again for me. Uh, and, the, you know, the bit where uh, Bruce Lee is sort of sneaking around Han's compound. Alex, how was the opening for you? Yeah, it was really good. It, um, it was really good to see the sort of throwing you into the action straight away. Um, his... his uh, disguise the the penguin or um i think it was a gull wasn't it it was ridiculous um but they didn't he didn't make he didn't make light of it or anything i thought you'd get a joke out of him for that but uh, nothing um and yeah it's just it's just nice to throw him straight into the into the fray which was good i think are we going to talk about the hotel scene afterwards oh yeah for sure um i think i think the hotel scene was what was good was that all of a sudden put it into context. It was like, it wasn't just throwaway. It was like, oh, hang on a minute. You know, there's a consequence to you sleeping around. Uh, you might, they might get killed, might get killed. Yeah, so. no, exactly. But I mean, this, this sort of initial mission where he, it, I think it's a drug laboratory that he blows up. Mm. Um, and then he's actually, he's actually apparently on holiday in Miami beach. And then M gets in touch with him via the CIA. And that's where we get the reintroduction of Felix Leiter. Jack Lords uh, originally portrayed him in Dr. No. But this time they they had to change the actor. Apparently Jack Lord wanted equal billing uh, on the movie, a, a massive pay rise and everything else. He wanted to be treated like the star. And uh, obviously that wasn't wasn't really the deal. So uh, So they got rid of him and replaced him. Um, and this treatment of uh, Felix was meant to be a more mature uh, version of the character, was meant to be older than the one that we'd seen in, in Doctor No. So, um, so yeah, I had to actually look it up during the film because I was sort of like, oh, is he Felix? Because I thought Jack Lord was Felix, and then that's where I kind of found out about all of this. So uh, so anyway, we, we first get introduced to Goldfinger at the swimming pool at this swanky uh, hotel in Miami, and uh, Goldfinger is, uh, he, he sort of comes down to play cards with this guy he obviously plays regularly with, and he's got an earpiece, and uh, I immediately knew what was going on as soon as I saw that earpiece, even though I'd never seen the film before. I thought, ah, he's got 
he's got someone watching the other guy's cards for him. And then it was obviously made even more obvious when he told the guy to switch places. Um, Phil, as an avid regular poker player, <laughs> uh, what were your thoughts about this uh, particular example of gamesmanship? I mean, it's... First of all, you know, if that's Miami, I mean, it looked more like West Wittering. I mean, it was, I mean, there was the plane that came through <laughs> that basically said, welcome to Miami. That was the only thing that told people in 64 in the UK that this was Miami. People had no preconceived ideas, clearly, about what Miami should look like, first of all. But as far as the cards, I mean, it's gin rummy. You know, it's, they clearly, the guy had the money to play, so it, Basically, if he couldn't figure it out from what was going on, then he deserves to lose his money, quite frankly. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> he was definitely... Um, what did you used to call people like that, Phil, back in the day? A chump. I mean, by today's standards, he'd just be a fish. He'd just <laughs> basically be just one that just gives out all the money. So, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, he deserves to lose the money if that's the way... He, if he couldn't figure out what was going on, basically. I mean, Bond very quickly works out what's going on. And uh, he goes up to Goldfinger's hotel room, manages to get in, and that's where he finds Jill Masterson, who's, who's uh, Goldfinger's escort for hire or whatever, companion, um, who's feeding him the information on the other guy's cards. Um, I thought... She was very, very good looking. There were a lot of... Bo- I mean, she was just the first of many Bond girls in this film. <laughs> oh, she was right? beautiful. So Bond interrupts her and then basically decides to take the direct approach with Goldfinger and basically blackmails him into losing. Otherwise, he would give him up to the CIA who are lurking around the hotel. Then he has his way with, with Jill. Then he's knocked out by Goldfinger's... Korean manservant Odd Job, and we don't actually see Odd Job at this point. We just see his shadow, and then the karate chop across the the back of the neck, and then uh, and then obviously Bond wakes up, comes to, and then that's where we find Jill dead. And it's it's a very very iconic scene. I think anyone, whether you've seen Goldfinger or not, knows the image of the girl lying dead on the bed, covered in gold paint. And then the the reason they gave for her death, I believe, was skin suffocation the actress herself because i was kind of a bit worried because she does look like she's really covered so i was kind of like well you know the characters died of skin suffocation but what about the actress but apparently they covered her modesty and then they painted her back but her front was left unpainted so that her skin could still breathe and the actress actually talked in an archive interview that um some of the way that she interacts with bond during their love scene was improvised so the bit where he's on the phone and she's sort of behind him with her arms around then she's twirling her hair around his ear she improvised all of that uh which i thought was was quite cute really Mm. so then we go back to london from miami and uh it's i think it's the gov is it the governor of the bank of england alex yeah Yeah, that bond and emma talking to yeah and they're slagging off the the quality of the whiskey and so on as well (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Which, and that's uh, why they can't. That's why he can't go and um, spend the time uh, with Miss Moneypenny as well. So that's the excuse as to why they, because Miss Moneypenny's like, well, come, come, come back for dinner, and and then he's not allowed to because M and the, the governor are going to go to the bank, Bank of England, and have a posh uh, uh, slap up meal, aren't they? Yeah, it's yeah because uh, M pointedly tells him when he's being debriefed. Uh, to turn up in black tie Mm. and then we get a little bit of the continuing uh, workplace inappropriateness shenanigans from money penny and bond so uh so yeah so the governor of the bank of england and m explained to bond that price of gold or something to be honest i actually wasn't listening at this point i I mean as far as that basically what it's doing is telling the world telling everyone what the world was like in 64 in a sense that um, they were still very much living by the gold standard. The way basically what would happen is, um, you know, you would basically buy and sell gold. So depending on what was going on in different countries, if there was a need for 
um, you know, a redistribution of um, industry because of, say, you know, recession or something like that. The, the trick was gold would be more expensive in other countries. So you'd sell that to get the cash that you need so that you can restart your industries. And that's what they were talking about in this scene. But now the world doesn't work well enough for gold standard. We basically sold it all. But um, it's harking back to sort of simpler times when gold was just the simple way of actually um, redistributing the wealth if, and, the, and getting back capital if you needed it um, by selling it to other countries that would want it for a higher price than what you originally got it. I mean, the reason I wasn't paying attention is because I'd noticed a little kerfuffle with the whiskey and the quality of it or whatever, and I just found that highly amusing. And then by the time I'd sort of watched where the bottle was being passed between them, I'd completely missed all of that gold price standards, economic markets nonsense. Just went straight over my head. Um, but then we get to the fun bit because then Bond has to be briefed by Q Branch. And this is Desmond Nguyen's first proper sort of go as Q in the way that we came to know and love Q Branch. So we go into Q Branch, we see them testing various things. I mean, there's one guy, like, he shoots a machine gun at this other Q Branch employee, like, riddles him with bullets, and then the guy opens his coat and he's got, like, body armor on. So obviously that's what they're testing. But you're kind of thinking, what if that failed? I mean, like, how many people before him, like, did they go through? It was just all very sort of, it was like a, it was like, it was like a kid's toy shop. But run by adults, highly irresponsible. Oh, and didn't he, it was absolutely and, bonkers, and I absolutely and loved didn't it. Didn't he say, "Oh, and after he shot him, oh, it hasn't been perfected yet. Hasn't been perfected yet." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> there, there was, uh, there was an interesting um, unveiling, wasn't there, in Q Branch as well? So the, this is the first time we saw the DB five. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was going to get so to that's, the DB five. That's iconic. Yeah, so he gives him a couple of um, a couple of gadgets first, doesn't he? He gives him a little transponder radio, which yeah. is for putting on to someone to to tail them, and then there's an even smaller version of it that will go in the heel of his shoe, which is for them to be able to track him, presumably yeah. if he gets into trouble of some sort and and so on. Um, and then obviously, how do you track people? Well, then that's where we get to the unveiling of the DB5. And oh my God, is that car... I think it's got to be one of the most beautiful production road cars ever made in my book. It's, it's spectacular. There's no sense that they put any kind of safety features on it. It is purely designed for beauty. It was stunning, that car. Just to, to kind of give you a little bit of background to the whole Q branch thing. Desmond Llewellyn, in an interview, said that at the rehearsal, he was working at a desk, and I'll just quote him, Bond comes in and I got up to greet him. Guy, who I presume is one of the producers, or uh, the director actually, sorry, said, no, 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 you don't take any notice of this man. You don't like him. And I thought, but this is Bond, this is James Bond, and I'm just this ordinary civil servant. I must admire him like everybody else does. Guy says, no, 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 no. Of course you don't. He doesn't treat your gadgets with any respect at all. I mean, the briefcase that you gave him in From Russia With Love, he just ignored it more or less, although it saved his life. So when you're describing the things on the car, you know perfectly well he's not going to treat them with the respect they should be. And of course, the penny dropped, and then the whole thing fell together. And then that was basically the inspiration, catalyst, instruction, whatever, for Desmond Llewellyn's characterization of Q for evermore. And I just think it worked like a dream. You know, he he played Q all the way through to The World Is Not Enough. And uh, I think the series was, was a worse place without him after he passed away. Mm -hmm. So I always get really emotional when I see him on the screen now. But I do think that the new Q, um, I forget the name of the actor, but I do think... Ben Whishaw. Yeah, Ben Whishaw. He actually made it his own and put his own stamp on it and created something that was unique to him, which actually allowed it to grow and evolve. But yeah, that whole period when, you know, J 
John Cleese was doing. It was just trying to mimic what, what Desmond Llewellyn was doing and it just didn't work as well. So the, the car gave them a lot of problems. A, a lot of the stuff on it, the weapons on it, were fully functioning, but the car itself wouldn't have worked in real life. So, for example, the oil slick that comes out the back of the car, there was they put basically a container of oil in the back to, for that to be able to flow out. But then the bulletproof shield that goes up at the back there was no room for that so in order to get that in they basically had to sort of take one out to do the other one and then when they were shooting the scenes for the other bit then put the other bit in Um, and the car just gave them all sorts of problems trying to figure out how to put all these amazing gadgets in but the car itself should we do our little um bruce forsyth uh game of what gadgets it's uh, the car had on it so starting with alex let's go round robin um so they had machine guns in the front uh left and right yeah phil next uh bulletproof uh uh windows at the front and, uh, and at the sides okay uh it had the revolving license plates that were valid in whatever country they were for uh well, we've got to do the ejector seat haven't we oh yeah we were, we were all waiting for that <laughs> Phil? Uh, machine gun fire from the uh, side mirrors. Alex already yeah. had that one. Yeah. Oh, is it from the side mirrors as well? Yeah. Also, don't forget the um, uh, thing to blow out tyres Oh my sides. God. Yeah, we'll talk about when he used that, but what an awesome... I could do with one of those <laughs> driving around London, actually. Uh, what else? Oh, the, the sat-nav. The yeah, sat-nav the with tracker. the... Yeah, with the tracking. Bulletproof, she always said... The oil drum, the re- the rear the smoke screen, screen. The re- rear windshield, uh, bulletproof rear windshield, bulletproof glass at the front. I mean, a lot of these we should we should be able to remember from No Time to Die because it was the same car. Mm. Uh, yeah, the smoke screen. I think that was it. Yeah, it's quite a lot of gadgets yeah. for one car I, though. I love the way that they made it really cutting edge about the uh, satellite navigation, having a range of a hundred and fifty meters. And that was supposed to be real cutting edge, <laughs> you know, whereas now you just get a cheap sat nav and that could cover the rest, the whole of the world. <laughs> but this had a range of 150 metres and that's really cutting edge. But they did. And then and then later in the film, it seems to have a, a range of several miles because they go off, obviously um, they go off, they go off and get separated. And yet you still see the bleeping. I just really wanted to see the map move, but I know that they couldn't do that <laughs> at the time because it was just too much of an ask. So I was seeing the blood dots going on. And I was going, what happens when it gets to the end? Like, do they need to get like some little guys in the, in, in the back, just like turning the map <laughs> to move it. So anyway, it was, it was just, it's lovely, but not very practical. No, that's right. I mean, I think the map did, well, it definitely changed because if you look at it, when yeah. it did change, when he yeah. first uses it in see. England, you can see, I think you could actually see North London and Hertfordshire around Pinewood Studios and so on on the map. And then when it obviously he's in uh, he's in Europe in Switzerland, then it changes Geneva, to yeah. Geneva and all of that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I don't think there was any kind of navigation equipment on any cars back then, right? Oh no, up. no, none at all. Yeah. Did you even get those radios back then where you had the R N D D? Do you remember, like, from when we were kids in your dad's car? Alex, you, you were maybe slightly younger, so maybe you wouldn't you know t- what I'm talking about, about. And then it had the sort re- of... Reverse neutral automatic. Mm. No, 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 no. On the actual radio itself, it was like push buttons, like five of them. And then it had, like, slidey... I oh, know I'm getting that mixed up with the climate control system. Anyway, <laughs> whatever. Then we meet Oddjob for the first time, because then... Uh, Bond goes to play golf with Goldfinger. By this time, I'd laughed out loud more than I did the sum total of Dr. No and From Russia With Love because they definitely amped up the jokes in the script. It was definitely a lot more lively. There were a lot more quips. and then there were, I mean, he had the earlier one-liner in the opening action sequence at the end when he electrocutes the guy in the, the bath and he says, shocking, absolutely shocking. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine a young Arnold Schwarzenegger was, you know, sort of sitting there with a, with his notepad, just making loads of notes. On the subject of which, sorry to go off on a tangent, so I was listening to the How Did This Get Made podcast, and those guys have such a laugh. But uh, they were reviewing... So they review films like bad films, right? Like, And that's why the podcast is called How Did This Get Made? 
And so they were reviewing Batman and Robin. Oh, and then they, they put a little montage reel together of, or an audio reel together of uh, all of Arnie's one liners from that film. Oh my God, it, they are so bad. So, so bad. I mean, that film as a Batman film is quite topical at the moment, is, is terrible, really. I do remember, um, I do remember seeing true. that in the cinema. Um, mm. But I was, I was never, you know, overtly concerned about whether it was good or it was bad. I was just being entertained, but I didn't appreciate how bad it was when I saw it in the cinema. <laughs> I saw it twice in the cinema <laughs> and I had the soundtrack. My sisters were massive George Clooney fans. That's my excuse anyway. Uh, Alicia Silverstone was in it. <coughs> she, so, she was. She was. And <laughs> mighty fine she was too. Goldfinger and Bond are playing around the golf. And Goldfinger is cheating, the dirty little rotter. Uh, he's at his tricks again. But Gon- Bond catches him out and uh, tricks him into losing the last hole and giving up, um, I think it was £5,000 or so, Goldfinger ended up writing yeah. out a cheque. Goldfinger kind of gives him a, a sort of threat and, and sort of tells Bond he basically knows what he's up to. And to show Bond what he's up against, that's where we're introduced to... Phil's favourite Bond film, Odd Job. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then we get the scene where Odd Job takes off his bowler hat and then swings it at that statue, and then the statue's head falls off. What do we think of Odd Job's entrance? Because this is our first sort of proper Bond villain, I guess, in that sense of the word, where you know you can almost see yourself buying the action figure of of him with all the accessories. He's just got such a um, good screen presence. So what I liked is that he he come across as very imposing, even though he really doesn't say anything apart from uh, 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 and points a few times. That's it. But um, yeah, he's just really good screen presence, um, and he must have practiced a lot to throw that hat in a pretty straight direction, because <laughs> that's that's really his his uh, uh, card, isn't it? His card. Uh, special move as it were yeah so um yeah so yeah no i loved it i thought it was is a very very good presence so they had a uh that actual scene of him throwing the hat and cutting the statue's head off um is actually three shots so they had the hat on a wire um and then they had the head of the statue on another wire and so as he throws it towards, that's the first shot. Then the hat in midair is the second shot. And then the third shot is them pulling the wire away from the statue's head. <laughs> so it looks... And nice. then when they put it all to get cut it all together, it just looked like one fluid movement, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. We've got to remember this is 1964. So, you know, unlike today where we'll just point and click with a mouse and sort of chop and move things around and cut things up when we edit sound or video back then editing was basically cutting 35 millimeter film and piecing it back together again uh it wasn't done in a computer so um you know technically i think these things and you know we'll get to to some audio stuff that they had to do as well Well, in fact we can talk about it now because gert frobe was a german actor and uh and his english was really bad he was learning english but he was speaking so slowly and the director said no you know speed up but then when he was speeding up, it was, you know, no, Mr. Bond, I want you to. And it just wasn't working at all. So they went and found another actor, an English actor, to actually do the voice of Goldfinger. Um, and so he's actually dubbed throughout the entire movie. And you'll notice that in the scene where Bond um, is captured and is tied to the laser laser machine. When you look at the conversation that's going on there, because I thought it was the audio on my Apple TV. I thought there was a mismatch or something, and I was about to dive into the settings. But then when I saw Connery talking, the audio was perfectly matched up. But then when Goldfinger was talking, it was just slightly off, and that's the reason why. So he was basically a la David Prowse in Star Wars. Um, Gert Frober was, was dubbed over for the whole film, apart from the scene where he's with the different Mafia bosses back at his place in Kentucky. Um, that's the only time we actually hear him using his actual speaking voice. Phil, you're looking perplexed. I had, I had no idea that it was uh, dubbed over, if, uh, if I'm honest. 
Um, I always thought his accent was quite fascinating um, because it didn't really have, although they, they pitched him as a Brit, it was clear that he had, he was either really well traveled or he was just, um, or he just wasn't sure sort of what accent or we, or as the audience, we weren't supposed to be sure where he was, where he'd come from very much like, um, Dr. No, where that accent was very sort of mysterious and it felt very mysterious with this particular actor as well. So I had no idea that he was German. I had no idea that he was, that he was dubbed over. Um, he just, was almost like a um, a presence that just kind of found his way into the film and then we never see him again. I don't think I've seen him in anything else. Yeah. So then we go to Switzerland and this is where we get to see the DB5 in action. Uh, not the weapons, but the actual car itself. And that engine just makes such a wonderful noise. So Bond is trailing Goldfinger and uh, he stops on a, a sort of on a, on a hill because uh, Goldfinger's car stopped uh, a couple of couple of twists and turns below and someone takes a shot at him so he goes to chase after them and it's a lady driving a mustang convertible um and you know you've got two cars that have just got the sweetest sound in in 60s motoring for my ears anyway uh, just sort of going at it but it was very reminiscent of future bond films where you had those sort of sequences like i think there was one in was it go i want to say golden eye there was a very similar where you know he's there's a girl in a car and Brosnan sort of, or am I thinking of one of the the Daniel Craig films? No, I think it's Goldeneye. I, I actually do think it's Goldeneye. He was uh, chasing after someone. Yeah. No. Do you know what? It's Mission Impossible too, with Dandy Newton and uh, Tom Cruise when they're, they, they're sort of chasing after each other in the cars and then the cars lock together and then they're sort of spinning around in slow motion, you know, typical John Woo uh, with the Hans Zimmer music going. Yeah, so I completely screwed that up. They must have been inspired by that in later Bond films anyway. Masterson getting killed. They called back to that, didn't they, in Quantum of Solace with uh, Strawberry Fields getting the way that she got murdered with, with the oil. Um... Sorry, I'm rambling on again now. Um, but anyway, it turns out that this lady is actually the sister of um, the other one. What's her name? Jill. Yeah, it's so Jill and Tilly. Um, so she's she's after Jill, Jilly and Tilly. So she's actually after revenge. So she was trying to assassinate Goldfinger, but you know, as Money Penny in Skyfall, she's a lousy shot. They go to a refinery and. Um, Sorry, they don't. Bond does. He sneaks into Goldfinger's uh, refinery because he's trying to work out how he smuggles the gold. And it was right in front of our eyes the whole time. And I didn't clock it until they were actually doing it. But that Rolls Royce Phantom is actually basically the gold <laughs> itself. They've smuggled gold. Yeah, they smuggled bullion in its parts. And then also they had to take it apart to sort of smelt it down, didn't they? I mean, I did question why they had to put the car in the plane. Because I did think to myself, like, you just leave a car at the airport and then have a car waiting for you when you get to the other end. You you can afford cars, so this isn't a problem for you. It's, but yeah, it didn't. It didn't. They did, I mean, it did. It did, when you, when they uh, showed that, you're like, oh, I get it. But then it also, you know, it it also explained why uh, Bond had his car shipped over as well. So maybe that was just the thing they were doing in the seventies when you were ridiculously, or sixties when you were ridiculously well off. Well, it's like that yeah. scene in French Connection, that whole business of you know the car being shipped over from France because the guy who wants to shoot documentaries has this particular uh, car that he wants to use, but that's how the drugs are being smuggled over from Corsica into the American market. Yeah. Oh, another spoiler alert. Sorry, I haven't, guys. <laughs> I haven't seen that film. So that again, you've never seen French Connection? No. It's the best car chase of all time is in the French Connection. I know. I've, I've heard. Um, yeah, I, I need to add that to my, um, to my film list. Uh, films to watch before I die. So, yeah, so they're smelting down that thing. Did anyone recognise the Chinese nuclear physicist that Goldfinger was talking to? No. no? Should I have? And I don't think Phil will get it from from 
you know, films that we know he hasn't seen Are from about Pink our last recording together. Bert Kwok was the nuclear physicist. No? Is it really? How do you guys not really know not, who Bert Kwok really is? Bert He's Quark? like an institution. Uh, yeah. Okay. That was him. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, which I was kind of disappointed that he didn't really have a bigger role. He was just the token sort of Chinese nuclear physicist. I mean, he's um, but that's been where token in British I'm films sorry. and TV for probably 60 years. So, <laughs> well, Yeah, I guess you're right, actually. So, But anyway, it was Burt Kwok, so there we go. Have you seen the Pan- P- Pink-, uh, Pink Panther movies yet? No, I have not. Okay, well, you need to do that because they're very good. Well, then I'll watch um, it if you watch French Connection. <laughs> okay. I think we're going to have creating a list of films to watch after we get through all the bonds. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> we've got a couple years yeah. yet. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so he overhears the conversation between them and that's where he hears the words uh, Operation Grand Slam and this comes in useful later on. Um because uh, when he leaves, that's where we come across Tilly again, uh, because she's there to try and have another go at taking Goldfinger out. Um, so they they have to escape because she, I think she actually fires the gun, doesn't she? And then the guards hear it and then they all come after her. Now, this is the other interesting thing as well. This is where we now start to see the typical kind of Bond villain with all the henchmen and so on. Um, and these were all, I guess, Chinese or Korean people, uh, Oriental, Far Eastern. Am I going to have to edit this out because I've just been completely politically <laughs> incorrect? Um, we're, we're just nodding I'm, and, and <laughs> it's just now. letting me. Yeah, I mean, I don't think not even that you're watching me dig you, my own. To be fair, <laughs> you guys might as well just do spade emojis and let me dig my own grave here. Um, <laughs> But I mean, they 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 were all sort of wearing, you know, Eastern type outfits with the kung fu type shoes and and so on, and they were all really really bad shots as well because they had submachine guns and they were just missing everything that they were shooting at. But then that's where we see the um, the Aston Martin in full action. You know, all the gadgets were used on it. Um, but unfortunately, they don't manage to get away, and uh, and that's where Odd Job kills Tilly with his bowler hat because she's running away through the woods when Bond is trying to cover for her, and he throws his hat and just clocks her in the head. And I was like, Carolina was sitting next to me. And she said, "Oh my God, has she has, has she been killed?" And I said, "Well, no, because surely his hat would have taken her head off." But I don't know if his if his his hat's got different modes to it. If it's got a kill mode where it will take your head off completely. And then it's got a stun mode, and then it's got a I'll kill you know kill you mode, but without any blood. I think you you've got to just remember the weight. So I suspect that she's probably at least she was at least knocked out. Although in in the film they just go, "Yep, she's dead." They were, oh no, she's not. So they have that kind of is she isn't she, which yeah. is funny. Yeah, I mean Bond doesn't really get time to even sleep with this one before she gets killed. So, nope. poor Tilly. Well, she was just trying to avenge her sister's death. Murder, I should say. Murder. <laughs> By the way, also, um, since yesterday, I've had the Goldfinger theme, and we haven't actually talked about the title sequence. Um, I've had the Goldfinger theme song going in my head. I can't get it out. But it's not the Shirley Bassey voice. It's Alan Partridge. <laughs> That? Okay, you've lost me, <laughs> Alex. I think I think Alex knows what I mean. Phil's just looking at me like mean. I'm crazy. In have you seen Alan Partridge, Phil? Has his screen just frozen? I think his screen's frozen, hasn't it? <laughs> That's it. You've you've frozen him. <laughs> I've I've completely shut down his internet and everything. But Alex, you know what I mean, don't you? <laughs> Yeah, I do. Early I mean, Alan Partridge, yeah. where he fancied himself as Bond, and obviously he was a big Connery fan. Yeah. And uh, yes, Goldfinger. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just um, 
It's just the accent on top of the song. Because <laughs> yeah. it's a nice song and it just ruins it. <laughs> and then, as soon as you've done that, you can't get it out of your head either. <laughs> no, so, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Such a cold finger. <laughs> da da da. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> I am so glad I didn't see that. <laughs> oh my god, it's brilliant! You've got to watch. Uh, Adam Partridge is great. I love Steve Coogan. Um, so, uh, so actually, let's talk about Shirley Bassey. Let's talk about that opening song and sequence because, all right, we're only three movies in, but um, you know, best Bond song to date, right? Not that from Russia with Love yeah. nonsense. I've, I've got to, I, out the park. I personally quite like from Russia with Love as well. I think this one's a bit more iconic, and you've got a lot more of the production in this song. But I really like from Russia with Love. I love that 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 smooth Matt Monroe voice that went through it. I mean, like mm. what what Shirley Bassey does so brilliantly is she creates an impact, which then means that other songs have to follow it on. Whereas you know, the Matt Monroe from Russia with Love is a little bit more understated, and I quite like that. So um, John Barry was obviously brought in to write the theme song, and they got Shirley Bassey in to sing it. And um, it was quite a fraught recording, and it went on for a very long time, all through the night to early hours of the morning, because Shirley Bassey was asked by the director to sing to the title sequence, and she had to get certain words and phrases on certain imagery that was in the um that was in the montage um so it was very very stressful because obviously what john barry would have wanted is just to let shirley bassey go um and they weren't able to do that um but the the end result was obviously what we know and love today it was absolutely phenomenal very powerful performance as well she was encouraged to just give it her all um, and it is one of the iconic Bond songs at the end of the day. The title sequence I thought was really cool as well because that really gave us, you know, sort of a flavour. And it called, there were some callbacks to From Russia with Love, the past films as well, which was quite nice because mm-hmm. it kind of just helped to link the films together as well. I always thought the Daniel Craig films were the only Bond movies that were actually kind of linked or had a sort of story arc, but I've got the feeling that these, these Connery ones do as as well because spectre kind of is the overriding thing in the background isn't it i think they were looked at as a whole rather than like any in, as individual films so i think they'd literally because they had the queued up i think it just makes it join so much better than sort of some of the other other films yeah so so Bond gets captured, and then we go to another really iconic scene that most people will know, and they'll know the quote, if even if they've never seen it before. I certainly did, which was Bond on a laser table, being interrog- interrogated. The laser is going up towards his um, little bobby, and, uh, you know, it's getting very, very close. I literally had my legs crossed at this point, and I was just saying to Carolina, I was like, I don't know how he's going to get out of this. Um, and uh, as as Goldfinger is leaving initially, Bond says, "Do you expect me to talk?" And Goldfinger says, "No, Mister Bond. I expect you to die." <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, Phil. <laughs> um, absolutely brilliant. And then Bond manages to save himself by saying, "Operation Grand Slam." which was just the kind of words that he picked up when when he was sneaking around their sort of gold smelting factory or whatever it was um and that was it that's enough for goldfinger to decide that bond is actually worth more to him alive than than dead um and then from here i think we then go to the stud farm in louisville kentucky yeah they have uh, the flight over to the states don't they because he he has his um, uh, he tries to escape, doesn't he? So, and then gets captured. Yeah. And then so, the, then they've got that flight. Who's who's flying the the, the plane? Pushy, <laughs> pushy galore. <laughs> I mean that that also like is the a most really re- iconic scene in the sense that you know he just comes into vision, sees on a black man. It's like who are you? And it's like my name is Pussy Galore, and then he just says, "I must be dreaming." 
I, mean... I must be dreaming. That was absolutely <laughs> brilliant because he comes to. Yeah, you're right. He was unconscious, and then he comes to, and then she's there. Um, and it, yeah, you're right. He says, "I must be dreaming." He's almost sort of cross-eyed as he says it, and it's just hilarious. Um, and then there's the um, the Asian uh, stewardess, and so he tries to sort of charm pussy straight away and um and then i'm not going to be able to get through this without <laughs> oh, oh God. um on a blackman i'm going to say i'm going to use the actress's name and All by right. this time on a blackman was famous for doing the avengers i believe is it the avengers it was one of those uh the avengers what was the other one no, not the marvel avengers film no 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 um was was this was the avengers before Goldfinger? So I Avengers was so. 62 to 64. Oh, it was. Okay. So, so it was filmed at the same sort of time, but then released just oh, so after she would have been Avengers. So she would have been known to audiences then? Oh, yeah. 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 Definitely. Absolutely. So, so her, her being in this was a really, really big deal at the time. So, so yeah, but Honor Blackman, again, absolutely stunning. I think she sadly passed away a couple did, of years ago. No, it was quite recently, actually. Was, I think it yeah. was quite recently, but that's twenty. So that's the reason why, because she was known to audiences, then that clearly must have been the reason why she didn't sort of give in to the charms, and she was sort of put forward as a strong, powerful woman, someone who's independent, who knows how to fly planes, you know, runs her own teams, and uh, is in control. Yeah. Mm. And she disappears into the cockpit after telling Bond, your, your charms won't work on me, I'm immune. And then he immediately turns around and checks out the stewardess. And, uh, He's from sort of the east around. via Exeter or somewhere like that. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I turned around to Carolina I said, he's a little sex pest, isn't he? <laughs> it's like he couldn't get anywhere with her. So then he turns around, you know, starts with the other one. Um, it so- gets worse. Yeah, exactly. It does get yeah, worse. Actually, this is, you're right. This is the thing. We're sort of we're sort of starting to say, hmm, he's a bit predatory, really. And then when we're getting to the end of this film, I mean, it's yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We have concerns. Yeah, yeah, we do. We we definitely do. Are you referring to the when they're rolling around in the hay scene? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we'll come on to that. Yeah, uh, if there ever was a 1964 hashtag Me Too moment, it was that. Um, so, so yeah, so, so he's taken to Goldfinger's stud farm in Kentucky and he's put in a prison cell. Um, but he promptly manages to escape. And again, I really, really love that scene of him in the cell. And then there's that one guard outside that's just staring, like completely emotionless. And then Connery sort of walks away, walks towards, you know, gives him a wave, goes back, comes back again, gives him a wink. And then the next time he comes back, he sort of goes down and disappears. Um, and it turns out that he's actually, you know, doing a Spider-Man up above the door. So when the guard walks in, he jumps down and, you know, knocks him out, gets his gun, and then he's he's out. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, first of all, what did you guys think of that? Because, again, it was a side to this portrayal of Bond that I'd never seen before from Connery because I always had a very fixed idea about him in in my mind and I just thought this maybe brought some of Connery's natural personality out as well it was very playful absolutely loved it it was very charming mm. it's so light isn't it mm. and it's just and it was so fun I mean the the fact that he just dips completely it's it's always like those people you see doing doing the elevator joke where they're just going down. And yeah. It's just like that. And um, yeah, no, it's so funny. I think leading up to that, when he actually gets taken into his cell, what was interesting was that they had to try and pretend that they were in Kentucky. And Kentucky's very, very warm. But, you know, so they had to, he had to kind of loosen his tie to sort of display that he's really hot. But it was probably like in, like, I don't know, Hounslow or somewhere like that was probably where it was shot. You know what I mean? So I think it was. It was. I th- yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think it was in Pinewood. Yeah, it was, actually, it was definitely local. It was certainly not on location. Mm. You know, you could tell yeah. just from the stud farm. You could see how clearly it just wasn't. I mean, they look like gypsy horses. Those people that ride around like gypsies when they're sort of training, and you see them. <laughs> you know, and they're just sort of wandering around. You know, trying to be totally oblivious to the fact that they're. 
Mm. Obviously, I have to say, I wasn't I wasn't really paying much attention to the surroundings. So for me, I was lost in the, you know, the sort of magic of it. And for, as far as I was concerned, they were in Kentucky. It was only at the end of the film when the credits came up and they only, they said, you know, filmed on location at Pinewood Studios, England and Switzerland. Yeah. And that was yeah, it. Yeah, they had to, they could not have replicated that scene with that road. Going back to that earlier scene where they're in Geneva. No. They could, there's no way they could have replicated that in the UK. That was... No. Yeah, you'd have to do you that. You know, it looked stunning. And, it, and um, you know, and, you know, so it was worth spending the money for that, you know, because it, it did make you remember it. But, yeah, going around just showing horses, you could have done that anywhere, and that's clearly what they did. <laughs> so... Yeah. Well, the, the reason that I was distracted is because of his... Um, I, I was just looking at his outfit because he was wearing a light grey three-piece suit. And then this is the film where I think every tie he was wearing was a knit tie. And I'm really into my knit ties at the moment. Mm. I, like, I overwear them so much, but they, they're they just so versatile and they just look so classy as well. So I was really, really appreciative of that. But again, I just thought the tailoring was so good in this film and he just looked so good. And the cut of his suit just suited because he's a very tall, very powerful looking guy. And I, th I think they just nailed it with his outfits again. Definitely. Mm. I think that also, you know, in spite of the fact you kind of have to suspend your disbelief in the sense that they, he's, you know, tackling guards. But then when he's out spying... The suit is completely pressed. It looks absolutely perfect. And we're just exposed to expect there's no ruffles on the suit whatsoever. But we'll just take that. It was worth doing it because it, it did look good in that regard. I will say this, Phil. If you've got a good quality, well-made suit with a very good quality cloth, you can get hit by a truck and walk away and have barely any evidence on that suit that you were hit by a truck. And do you know how I know this? Because you were hit by a truck. Because that's what ha In January 2017, when I had that accident and that lorry came through the back of my scooter and I was trapped underneath it, I was wearing a full three-piece suit, as you would expect. But um, although underneath I was injured, the actual suit itself is still hanging up in my wardrobe behind me. It's absolutely fine. Maybe a little graze on one shoulder. But, yeah, I, I was actually shocked at just how well it survived. Yeah. But not but not immediately. That's the thing. There was an immediacy after he has the fight. There would be some ruffles. Um, you've let it hang. And it's it actually looks okay now. But it wouldn't have looked amazing immediately afterwards, would it? Oh, no. Immediately afterwards, after I'd, you know, taken details, taken witness statements and so on, and then rung the scooter de dealer in Charlotte Street to tell them my bike's all mangled up on the side of the thing. Because I had so much adrenaline going... I know this now. I didn't know it at the time. I had so much adrenaline going through me, I couldn't feel any of my injuries. So I then just got a cab and went straight to my appointment and then apologised for being a few minutes late. My client noticed a little bit of blood and so on and he said, oh my God, are you okay? And I said, oh, I just got hit by a truck. Anyway, I'm sorry I'm late and then was going to get down to business. And he was he was like, no, 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 whoa, wait, just hang on a second. What the hell are you talking about? Just sit down, slow down. Um, so, uh, yeah, you're, you're looking really concerned, <laughs> Phil. I'm just, I, was, but I, was I just got on with my day. I got on with my day. I met a member of, uh, 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 I think it was the Bahrain Royal family, one of those... Emirs or whatever. Hopefully he doesn't well. listen to this podcast. Um, sorry, shake someone. And uh, met him, uh, you know, so that was a very highbrow appointment. He didn't seem to notice that I'd, you know, been in a fight with a with a plant truck. But yeah, there you go. So anyway, the, the moral of the story is a good quality suit will do you for fighting, getting out of Goldfinger's <laughs> layer, all the rest of it. Brilliant. Everyone should wear suits. Um, far nice. better value for money. I think you've got to sell that a bit more than you've previously. No, normally, you're just talking about style. You're not, you're not talking about the like cocoon effect that it that it has. Um, 
So I think you should you should sell that a bit more. Yeah. Well, I mean, it didn't have that much of a cocoon effect because about five days later, the adrenaline finally wore off. My neck seized up and my, my wife had to rush me to A&E. So, mm. you know, there we go. Well, okay. So maybe Kevlar in the suit next time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, good idea. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah. Anyway, where where we're at is Stud Farm. So, so yeah. So Pussy Galore's got her little, um, got her little thing going on there. So she's got her female pilots who are all dressed in there. She's flying circus. Yeah. <laughs> that's literally it's what Pussy it was Galore's called. Flying Pussy's circus. Flying yeah. circus. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But again, this was the whole, you know, what we know and love the older Bond films for, and it's not just the connery ones it's also the roger moore ones particularly where you know you've got these groups and organizations and gangs and all you know whatever and they're all wearing these jumpsuits and you know tight lycra things and all of this and in all these funny colors and whatever and you know um a bit octopus is the the one oh god another pussy reference um is the is the one that immediately springs to mind as another example right because she has her sort of, you know, gang minions, whatever. Yeah. It's late. It's Monday already. I'm I'm completely <laughs> done this week. Uh, it's another like worst episode of this podcast ever. Um. So um. But but this is where we learn of. Oh no! So he escapes from the cell, and then yeah. in the meantime, Goldfinger has got all these sort of mafia bosses or whatever who he owes money to all of them, and then. He, they're all playing pool on this table and then suddenly he moves some levers and the whole room changes and then on hydraulics this model of Fork Knox sort of appears and then he starts explaining his grand plan which is basically to fly planes over Fort Knox they're going to rob it and uh, not rob it they're going to infiltrate Fort Knox by knocking out all of the army with this CX nerve gas thing and then they're going to let off a little atomic bomb in the gold reserve so that the gold has basically got radiation in it. So for the next 60 years, they've disabled the US's gold reserve. How am I doing so far, Phil? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, Which is, which is metaphorical of what they actually did during the Depression was they were supposed to actually send it overseas and they didn't. So... Very metaphoric of the actual of the reasons the depression happened in the nineteen twenties. Oh wow! Ooh, look at you, you little <laughs> history student. And uh, and so what that will do is drive the price of Goldfinger's gold up because it's supply and demand. He reduces the supply and increases the demand, and then the, his prices go up. That's how economics works. Yeah, that's right. right. But he doesn't yeah. actually explain that to those minion. Uh, you know, uh, mafioso people. He basically says to them, "No, but... that it is that it is a robbery." And this is significant of how the British films at the time, you know, were casting the Americans because they still had them in that kind of six, sorry, nineteen thirties sort of Spencer Tracy mode. Hey, what's the big idea, huh? What are you playing games here? You, can't, you, can't, you know, what, you know. It's like, hey, come on, you want to, you want to on a piece of me? Come on here, why don't you? It was very Spencer Tracy of that nineteen thirties sort of film noir gangster film, you know, vibe. But it was nineteen sixty four, so the, clearly the British audiences hadn't really sort of caught up with how American films were being made at the time, and so they, you know they went along with it because it was very much a British film. Um, but uh, and they made the Americans look a little bit more incompetent than the Brits. Essentially, that was yeah. the idea. But that looked to me like the idea behind it. Well, he goes and kills them anyway, doesn't he? Because then afterwards, then Bond, they you know share a drink together or whatever, and uh, Bond. That's where he works out what Goldfinger's actual plan is, and he says to him, you know, that nerve gas actually will end up killing people. It's not a what's it. So. Um, and Goldfinger's like, yeah, and you know, best bit is I'm taking you there, and I'm going to drop you in with the bomb. Um, I think because I kind of missed that little bit there, but I'm guessing that's what was going to happen. That he, you know, he would get his revenge on Bond by handcuffing him to the atomic bomb and yes, just leaving right. him yeah. in the reserve to die. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay. That's the that was the plan. Yeah. So then Bond tries to convince 
I'm going to say Honor Blackman, um, to switch sides and, you know, um, basically not do the whole nerve gas thing because she would end up killing hun- like hundreds of thousands of people or whatever. Um, and then they have a, a, a little tussle in the barn where she does her judo on him and then they end up in the hay and then he tries to kiss her and she holds him away quite forcefully and then this kind of I was looking at my <laughs> wife and I was like okay this is a little bit rapey and she was like yeah it totally is like she was not in the head vigorously she was like that is so wrong yeah well <laughs> also also it's it's the kind of it is the stereotype of a bond girl that doesn't want it but then does want it <laughs> except that anyone now would just be like no that there's just no way like doesn't matter. I mean, yes, you're charming, but still, you, you, that's not how it works. <laughs> Excuse me. So, it's just bless you. Bless um, you. Yeah. So it's just yeah. It, that was the worst bit of it. Um, it's hard to look at these things with uh, an old-fashioned eye, um, and I give them a lot of passes for it. But it's just it. Some bits of that just start stopped. They, they they were you know more incredulous and less less um uh compelling as a storyline and you know i think that was just a bit but i do think yeah. it's important I mean, it's definitely that they... it's in its defense it's of its time yeah. right of course yeah of course it's of its time yeah it does, and it takes none of itself seriously which is an important point because yeah. everyone takes things seriously now whereas actually it doesn't. That's not what it's trying to do at all. Yeah, it's, so. it's important that we do know that this exists and that these films existed yeah. and that we look back on them because we're glancing back. This is not what we're about now, but this was very much what was seen, deemed acceptable at the time. Yeah. Whether, whether there's, it's yeah, right or wrong. There's lots, you know. lots of them. Direct yeah. quote from Honor Blackman herself. She said in an interview, Harry Saltzman always said that women came out of a Bond film dreaming about Bond and the men came out walking tall. That's the attraction of the Bond films. I think that men identify with him and the females want him. So she was totally on board with, you know, that whole kind of ethos around Bond and so on, which is why I say in its defence, it's just... I guess there's a modern audience kind of sitting there with everything that, you know, all the conversations that go on nowadays and, and sort of looking at how far we've we've come. Um, it did just initially feel kind of quite uncomfortable, you know, because there was a lot of resistance there. And then all of a sudden, anyway, we won't dwell on it. Um, <laughs> but so, it's not taking itself seriously. And that's no. the thing. This isn't, this isn't a, a serious film. If it was... We'd be we'd be judging it by a different measure, but it's not. It's but, it's laughing at itself as it goes through that. Here's another thing that's interesting, though, that the the in in an early treatment of the script, I believe, Honor Blackman's character was meant to be a lesbian, and I need to try and find the quote. I think it was from one of the producers or a sc- or, or one of the script editors. But basically, she was a lesbian. She just but but then Bond is able to convert her because she'd just never been with a man before that you know, was worthy or whatever. <laughs> oh, dear. It's just absolutely absurd. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, back in the 60s, you could... That was my point. That was that was my point. It's like, looking at that on face value, you're just like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> but of course, it is ridiculous. It's not meant to be serious. <laughs> it, it's Apparently, the, the funniest thing was... Uh, there we go. So... On in the in the plane scene where Pussy um, introduces herself, he says here, um, uh, Sean Connery, who replied, "I must be dreaming." The original script had Bond replying, "I know you are, but what's your name?" <laughs> that's, that was even worse. It's like, oh. So yeah, they, they there's no part of this where they they don't know what they're doing and that they're being like. Uh, they're, they're not being serious in any way they know they know that <laughs> yeah well then we we get to the big sort of set piece at fort knox um so bond is there the atomic bomb is delivered uh odd job is there kitsch or whatever his name is goldfinger's right hand man is there um but 
it turns out that there's been a double cross because the uh, CIA guys all wake up with Felix. And what's happened, it transpires, is that Bond did actually convince Pussy to, you know, not go ahead with Goldfinger's plan. And she switched the gas in the girls' planes around, or the girls switched the, the gas around. And what they sprayed didn't actually knock the army out. And Bond had managed to get a message out to the CIA to warn them. And, um, or did he? Because that guy, the mafia guy who he slipped the message in his pocket, he got crushed by a car. Yeah, that didn't work at all. Yeah. Like so so the fact that they managed to get this message out, they don't really explain. Oh. Cuz cuz that was that was crushed. There was no and then it was taken back to um uh, the farm. So yeah, there was there was no evidence at all. So is there a or maybe maybe she got the message to them for him. Let's assume that. Yeah, yeah let's go with that. Because when the car comes back completely crushed, he realizes that his his plan failed, so he didn't manage to get the warning message out to the CIA. So maybe that's when he then converts yeah. Pussy from being a lesbian to being heterosexual. But hang on a minute, no, but didn't he have to... the uh, transmitter in his shoe and he had sent and he basically he had activated that and those American um CIA guys were saying, Well, shouldn't we just go in? And then they said, No, he can take care of himself, he'd call us. And because yeah, yeah but they gold... had that scene. Remember, they had the scene where they were um, watching over a fence, and so then then you have um, Goldfinger saying, "Yeah, let's give them a show to say show that Bond is is all all okay." Um, and and then they had this whole, "Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll come back, we'll come back." Then he's got it in hand. Um, so that was that was the that was the thing, and then obviously at that part, that's when you have the barn scene with with pussy so yeah yeah because goldfinger knew that the cia were lurking around and that's why he got pussy to sort of dress up really nice and then sort of walk arm in arm with bond so that they would think that he was okay and he didn't need rescuing or anything yeah so there was a lot of kind of little things going on so you know you could say it was quite a complex clever intelligent movie um so anyway, so we're at the gold reserve and then um and then so the army kind of opened fire on Fort Knox where Goldfinger's men are and uh, Goldfinger locks the vault locks Kish Bond an odd job inside it with the bomb which has now got a countdown timer going and that countdown timer that bomb should have gone off by my working out because I basically started counting down with it and I just continued in real time and like they'd have all been dead yeah it's hollywood time yeah yeah <laughs> i like the way eventually when they do stop it it stops on 007 oh, oh what nice. a coincidence <laughs> um they know that they know the name of the movie so yeah so kish basically gets killed because um he doesn't want to die so he goes to try and disarm the bomb and odd job gets him and throws him 40 meters or whatever uh, off a platform and he meets a very sudden death um, and then this leads to the final confrontation between Bond and uh, what's his face, Odd Job, um, and the actor who played Odd Job, who I believe was a wrestler or a weightlifter. Alex, fact check that for me. Harold Harold uh, Sataka. So so what? Harold uh, Sa- uh, Sakata. Yeah, I know, I know what his name was. I just wanted to hear you say it again. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be mean. I can't do this accent. Sorry. Was he a weightlifter? I can't tell. He did a lot. He did a lot of um, quite a few films and TV. Okay, but I can't tell. Um, oh, he was a professional wrestler. He was a professional wrestler. Wrestler. Yeah. He yeah. um when he because he can't talk, he's meant to be mute, isn't he? All he says is ah yeah. ah. He reminds me of the Martians from Mars Attacks. Ah mm-hmm. ah. I I kind of felt that he was like Bolo from Enter the Dragon. It's sort of like goes Bolo, and then he goes. Like that, so it was kind of like <laughs> that's that's what I was kind of reminded of. I just said Bolo from Enter the Dragon was slightly more competent, true, a fighter. But anyway, true. Um, but he injured himself in that end scene where he gets electrocuted. Like he got burnt apparently, but he um, he he didn't sort of want them to cut filming or whatever. He just went with it. So the agony on you see on his face as he dies is real. 
I mean, obviously he didn't die, but you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, so that was quite a brutal end fight because there were I was good doing a lot of ouches and so on. And I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. Um, Phil, were you quite sad when Odd Job? Got not killed? at all. I mean, it's just, I know he's your favourite. <laughs> I know he's my favourite, but no, not at all. I mean, it was it was obvious it was going to happen. Um, but again, you know, it was the mechanics of the filmmaking in the sixties. There was a lot of danger, and it was real. You can't, you couldn't, um, you know, fake that. It was like what we were talking about from Russia with Love. You know, there was some definite danger when they're on the water shooting out fire from the um, from the boats, and there was some clear and present danger on the set in Pinewood when they were shooting that um, and someone could have got seriously hurt but you know for the art and for the love of the of the craft of making films they they did it to entertain us and I think it succeeded yeah what is it about odd job for you that makes him such a great villain Phil what is it about him that captured your imagination I think with other um with other villains, they tried very hard to have a kind of a softer side or they tried to have another dimension. Odd job was just a henchman and he just delivered and didn't try and do anything else. And that's what I appreciated about how they put it together for this particular film. And I just wish they stuck with it because when I think about Jaws and what they tried to do to add a different dimension to him, just really gets on my nerves. I've never liked it when they, when they make, <laughs> what is an obvious big person or a scary person, you know, to have a, a, a weak personality. Um, and that's something that Odd Job clearly doesn't have. Okay. Good job. John's not He's here. He's so charming, though. That was the thing. It, I'm just remembering. That's Moonraker, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, it's just such a charming scene. It, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, but it's just so charming when you get meets a little, the little um, uh, woman. And anyway, sorry, I think we get off distracted. We're a few now, films I ahead. I mean, I think in Jaws, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to defend Jaws for a second because John's not here. And I know John is very <laughs> fond of that character. But the thing with Jaws is that as scary as he was in the earlier more films when he first popped up, he was the perfect foil, really. He was the perfect Roger Moore villain. And having that slightly, that sort of evolution of the character where eventually he does find love and, you know, we see a softer side to him and, and then he does become... It, it. If you think back to that fight on the train in, I think it was in The Spy Who Loved Me, there's a lot of humour in that fight. It's completely different to the fight between... Um, Robert Shaw's character and Sean Connery in From Russia With Love, which was very, very brutal, economical, you know, it was a violent fight. Whereas in 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 that Roger Moore film with Jaws, there was a, lot, a bit of tongue and cheek going on in there as much as Roger Moore was getting duffed up by this huge guy. But, you know, I think Jaws was basically the perfect villain for a Roger Moore era Bond. Um, so anyway, so that's what I'll say about it. Odd job, he was all right for me. I got it at the end, right? I got what he was about when Kish was trying to save himself and then Odd job throws him off the platform. And, and Odd job's loyalty to Goldfinger is completely unquestioned to the point where he was just prepared to die to achieve his boss's ends, rather like um, something else that's going on in the world at the moment, unfortunately. You, you don't get that kind of loyalty at a, a working environment anymore, do you? No, not at all. I mean, I mean, people you know, these too days. Many people, oh. they're just, they put their notes in and they'd be off. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, and the people around them, you know, they, they wouldn't, wouldn't be prepared to put their foot forward and chuck their colleague off the top of the building. <laughs> Exactly, you know, <laughs> that means that means there's more money for the performance uh, bonus at the end of the quarter, guys. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, so we're getting towards the end of the film, and uh, Goldfinger managed to escape Fort Knox. Um, so Bond is uh, being thanked by the Americans, and the president wants him at the White House for lunch, which is rather nice. Pussy is flying Bond to the White House, to Washington. And then all of a sudden, Goldfinger somehow has hijacked the plane and appears in the military uniform that he was disguised disguised in earlier. 
and uh, in they have a fight, and in the struggle, um, the gun goes off. Now, the the thing that again, Carolina sort of her outburst this time was cheeky fat bastard. He's even got a golden gun. <laughs> And I explained That's... to her that if she's seen... Any, I mean, if you go down to Peckham, right, the top boy gangsters down there have got gold guns. I mean, it's nothing, you know... It's, just, it's a historical thing, right? If you were the head of a criminal organisation... It's another one of our questions. Um, what would be your weapon of choice, Alex, and how would it be decorated? <sighs> That's really hard to question, actually. Would you use a gun? You don't really strike me as a gun I person. I like... Eh, yeah, but I wouldn't be very good without a gun. I think... I think. <laughs> I mean, I quite like the idea of something exotic like machete, but it would be even worse with that. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe, maybe a, a, a nice hand pistol would probably work for me. But yeah, you're right. Then what do you do? Do you go with gold because uh, you know it's got a bit of bling to it? You probably would, wouldn't you? Yeah, so, so yeah, that's a good point. Now you turn me around to gold guns. Now I think, oh I think god, we'll go well, I've created a monster. <laughs> next, Where'd you get me from? <laughs> next one, you know, from Play Paul's turn. If 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 we were in Scarface, he'd be our very own Tony Montana. It's Alex Hansford. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, Phil, too nice. I, I would, I would Phil, have weapon have of sword. choice. I think every time uh, any gangster <laughs> of any note pulls out a sword, you know, whether it's you know, you know whether it's like the Godfather or, or or someone like that, you know, having a sword, I think, is creates the biggest impact. It shows the most fit, you know, because it it it's so immediate. You know, you see what the actual, you know, the sharpness of it, and, and you know what it's going to do. You know, with the gun, you're not, you're not as sure. Whereas it's clear what's going to happen with with the knife. You're going to get cut, and I just think a sword is uh, creates the biggest impact for me. Mine would be a baseball bat. A baseball, bat. but with a button on it. Yeah, but with a button. Well, because the thing with a baseball bat, you bring a baseball bat out, right? They know this is not going to be over quickly. So Alex comes out with his pistol and the guy knows that <laughs> it's probably going to be over pretty quick. It will hurt for a microsecond and then it's lights out. Fine. You with your sword, if he's lucky and you cut his head off, it's instant. It's done. But a baseball bat, you bring a baseball bat out, the guy knows this is going to hurt and it's going to take a bit of time. And that's what I want them, especially if they've been stealing my drugs or, you know, lawn like stealing the money that I've been laundering or whatever it is that I've been doing in my criminal enterprise. I want them to know this is going to take time and this all is right. going to hurt. All right. Do you know what? Okay. I would also... Okay. I'll give you a scenario then. you got the sword. You want to send a message to someone who's double crossed you. How about putting the mm -hmm. sword in the mouth, giving them a smart permanent smile. Okay. Look, Phil, now you've, <laughs> I've, you've just, Okay, great. You've just taken it too far. I was going to just tell you about the, the spike attachment to my baseball bat where I press a button on the handle and then spikes come out the top. And then when you hit them, it just sticks in them. And then you have to really wrench it to get it out. And then you stick it in them again. Anyway, moving on. Can, this is definitely Can you keep now. your baseball bat? Uh, like, can you fit it on your Vespa somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> Because cause I think thing is, that way, if anyone knocks you over again, you can just be like, right, okay, I'm ready for this now, right? <laughs> and get the bat out. Yeah. The problem with the baseball bat I actually have is it's really, really big. Like it's it's huge. I don't know how oh, okay. many... Okay, so it's not very subtle. It's about a metre, yeah. It's called a Boston Slugger. Nice. Yeah. Uh, it won't even fit in my Mini. It's, like it's too wide for the boot. <laughs> So it just sits in the hallway. Oh, just sits in the hallway. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. I don't have to use it that often. Sometimes I chase people off with it. Uh, anyhow, sorry. <laughs> it's like tailoring talk to tailoring <laughs> self-defense. Um, so, so the gun goes off, blows a window out. We get a bit of science going on because there's outdoor pressure, indoor air pressure, 
and anyway it all sort of mixes up together to suck Goldfinger out of the window which was really that looked painful because he is a fat guy and those aeroplane windows were quite small I'm surprised that there wasn't blood and guts flying everywhere but uh, but yeah what what do we think about Goldfinger's demise Alex <sighs> It was, I mean, I was a bit disappointed because I've watched 70s um, airplane films, like disaster films before, and normally it doesn't end that way. It normally ends with like the top of the plane off and all that kind of stuff. Um, So yeah, so I was just like, well, I I don't know how he managed to be the only one that was sucked out, but oh well. It is a way to go, isn't it? Yeah, no, totally. That's the thing, right? Because Bond <laughs> is kind of holding on for a, a couple seconds, and then in the next scene, and he's calmly made it into the cockpit. On a Blackman's looking yeah. all panicked, trying to sort of wrestle with the plane and get it to nosedive to sort the pressure thing out because you have to decrease your altitude, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah, he's kind of unruffled. It's the suit. Mm. It's the suit. <laughs> It's all about the suit. It's all about the suit, and then we get to the to the end scene where um, they're on they they they've landed. Obviously, they've managed to parachute out of the plane that's exploded. The CIA are in a helicopter looking for them, and then Bond says, "You know, this is no time to be rescued." Covers them with the parachute, and then they get down to business, presumably underneath. And that's it. It's the end. James Bond will return in Thunderball. We're told immediately. Credits are very short in these films, actually. But uh, but yeah, that was it. That was Goldfinger. So what did we think? Um, and we're only comparing it to the previous two. Do we like it more than the previous two? Do we might like it less? Somewhere in the middle, Alex. What was your what was your kind of overall um, sort of thoughts and rating? So what are we rating it out of? What what are we going out of ten again? Or... So I think this was. A solid eight and a half. I think it was it was it was um, better watching than the last one, and I think I think actually I would give it yeah give it eight and a half. I wouldn't give it nine. I think that's a bit much, but I think eight and a half. Yeah. And um, what did you prefer about this one compared to from Russia with Love? Um, I liked there was more humour, and also I think it was more. There was more action. There was a lot more action scenes in this, and I think that helped. Kind of reminded you that it's, this is an action film. Um, so I think I think thinking man's Bond is not what what uh, early Bond is about, really. Yeah, Phil. Well, I'm contemplating this because this these I think all three films have had their own merits, and they've tried to find a way of actually. Um, setting a tone for the rest of the films. And I would say that this edges it because of the car. The car is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Um, it then moves into Geneva, which is the great location, but they did never went over the top. So in the previous films, they went to all the different places, whereas this one, it just stuck to Geneva and then Bristol, you know, North Holt, you know, maybe some Essex, Southend on Sea, or West Wittering. You know, it never. It was. It was clear that they probably blown the budget on the car in Geneva. You know, with this one, so they they spent a lot more time on creating um, an atmosphere. And I, I think I would say this does edge the other two. I'm going to actually give this one a nine. I think there's. Wow, I think nice. there is more to this film and i think this is the sort of film that i could watch again and again and again and i think it would get better every single time i see it so i'm gonna say this is a nine um and i actually kind of want to see it again so um i think i gave dr no an eight and i gave from russia with love an 8.5 and i'm sort of <clears throat> i'm thinking that i preferred instinctively from russia with love because it it just felt more like that sort of old school kind of classic sort of sky spy, uh, sky spy caper but then you're right there are things about goldfinger i mean it it sets the that finally we get the bond formula that we know and love today um it has the gadgets and that you know we we get to see q branch properly for the first time and and you're right that car is uh, it's just amazing um but then 
there are some slightly campy elements for me that sort of jarred a little bit. And I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, yeah, the, the acting is not as good in Goldfinger as it is in Russia with Love. I think the acting performances in, from Russia with Love are probably the best out of the three films I've seen so far. But I think yeah. that this, because as we've been talk, discussing, it doesn't take itself too seriously. You know, we've not got people who desperately want to be in Shakespeare playing villains. This is um, this is what it is. You know, they've dubbed. Now that I know they've dubbed the, the the actor throughout to give him a kind of you know iconic sound and a co- iconic atmosphere, I think that's why I like I want to see it more and more because I think that I'll, I'll get newer elements every single time I see it. So back to my rating, Phil. Um, I I think part of me wants to move my rating for From Russia with Love up to a nine. And give this an 8.5. Because this was definitely better than Doctor No, I thought. And I, I would want to re-watch this more than Doctor No. But I still have this... I don't know, I really... From Russia with Love, especially the whole train sequence and so on. But then every time I think about... Every time I come to the conclusion that that's what I'm going to do, I then remember that batshit crazy scene in the gypsy village or whatever. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, exactly. And then it and then it knocks half a point off of from Russia with love for me again. So I think I'm going to stick stick that stick from Russia with love's original rating, and I'm going to give this an eight point five as well. So it's as good as from Russia with love. It's a different film, but for different reasons. Um, I really did like it as well. There were some elements that I wasn't so sure about. And again, uh, Honor Blackman's character's name was very, very off-putting for me because I just took me out of the film every single time they said it. But uh, but yeah, there we go. And, uh, you know, th- there was a lot more humour. I'm glad it was tempered because the original script apparently was very, very jokey. They'd really amped up the humour. Um, and um, they'd had a... There was a conference meeting with Sean Connery, Cubby Broccoli, um, and... Um, I think it's Maybaum Mather was the um was the script the original script writer. And the on the very first thing that they talked about is Sean Connery says he feels the tone of the script was all wrong. Once a serious approach with humour interjected subtly, as in the other films. So the, the original treatment of this was completely like joke after joke after joke. Um, so it was Connery who actually got them to temper it and bring it back down. And I think in the end, they probably got the tone just about right. Yeah. So yeah, 8.5 for me. I mean, the film holds an aggregate score to this day of 99% on Rotten Tomatoes, and I couldn't actually find any bad reviews for it from the time. It was very, very successful. I think the budget... Actually, Alex, if you've have you got IMDb up there, can you check the budget? I might have it here actually. Budget three million dollars, box office one hundred twenty-five million. Yeah, it was the fastest-grossing Bond film. So. Yeah. Yeah. Did well. Did, did well. Did extremely well. So, and they'd already greenlit Thunderball by this time, um, so that was undergoing pre-production, and then they just basically went straight into filming that. Sean Connery was he was working a lot during this time. Because the BBC went to film him, <coughs> to interview him on set. Uh, and it was when they were filming the uh, where he's imprisoned in the Kentucky ranch. And uh, and she was saying, oh, you know, what's it like? You know, you did a Bond movie last year, you're doing another one this year. And he's like, this is like my fifth movie in 12 months. And he'd done Broadway and he was doing a play. Um, so he was working extremely hard during this time. And hats off to him. So there we go. I think anything else you guys want to add about this film? No, I think you've covered it all. I think it's, I mean, we've, we've gone through quite a lot of information um, with this film, um, as we always do. And I think it's important that we get across, you know, there was a, there's a huge amount uh, that goes into it. And um, it just, it, I think this one was a good sort of template for um, future bonds and we'll find that out as we go forward I guess exactly I'm really looking forward to Thunderball now 
Um, so yeah, look, guys, thank you so much for for joining me again. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I think we might have some people who um, are going to be joining us on future episodes. Uh, one of my clients actually is a massive Bond fan. He actually wrote in um, to tell me off for not mentioning any of the cars in previous films, but he's right. But the DB5 in this, I think, is the iconic one, isn't it? It's the one that really grabs the attention. But um, yes. I've I've invited Kevin, and I know he'll be listening to this. Uh, thank you so much for your support. And uh, please do let me know your favourite Bond films, and we would love for you to join us. Um, Kevin, what Kevin doesn't know about cars, and Bond cars in particular, is not worth knowing. So when we do get him on, we're we're in for a real treat. He's uh, he's amazing, um, brilliant. Phil, have you had a good time? It's been awesome. Thank you very much. Welcome, Alex. Thank you so much. I think we'll be getting together soon, won't thank we, you. for Play Paul's turn? Because uh, we we've yes. got a few things we need to catch up on and talk about, including yeah. the new Batman movie. Um, if you've enjoyed this episode, you will absolutely love. Um, our other podcast, Play Paul's Turn, with myself, Alex, John Evans, Alex's lovely wife, Amy, and Mark. Um, you can find us on any platform, I think, where you get your podcast. That's Play Paul's Turn. Give us a little subscribe over there and drop into a few of our episodes. I'm sure you'll have fun because uh, I get to hang out with some of the loveliest people in podcasting uh, every other week. And it's an absolute joy. Um, so yeah, thanks, Alex. That's a good point, actually. What about Tony and Talk? Um, so yeah, that is it for this episode. Thank you once again for joining us. Um, we are now on Instagram at Tailoring Talk Podcast, and you can now email the show. I finally, after one year, by the way, guys, this is a one year anniversary of Tailoring Talk, so thank you for being oh, with happy me. Happy birthday! Here. Thank you. Um, ah, ah. um, so. <laughs> Uh, because you know, one year old, I just speak like odd job. Um, so yeah, so we finally do have an email address for the show. It is tailoring talk podcast at gmail.com. So feel free to write in, uh, tell me what we're doing wrong and what we're doing right. Feedback is always great because that's how we make the show better. And if you have got a favorite Bond film in mind, write in, and who knows, you could be joining us to review the Bondathon will continue next month with Thunderball. Make sure you don't miss a thing by hitting that subscribe button and we will see you on the next one.